Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Black Baseball Mixtape. I am your host, Cheats. Got to shout out our good friends over at Stilo, Stilo Distribution, Stilo Media, Stilo Sports. Make sure you check everything out there. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really excited. If you follow the Black Baseball Mixtape, you'll know last year in the offseason of the college baseball season, we did a series of interviews that featured five black head coaches uh, that were coaching at PWI institutions. One of those coaches was a historic hire. It was the first hire in the University of Memphis, and he was the first black man to ever lead that program. And I will tell you, I left that interview being so impressed with this individual, uh, just thinking to myself, man, Memphis got the right coach, got the right man for the job. And then the individual we're talking about went on to have the best season, baseball season, the University of Memphis since 2017. He picked up 29 wins, I believe. Then, I a, look, then I'm, 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 I'm waiting here, and they're building, and then I find out, I look at the news one day and find out that said coach we were talking about got hired away from Memphis after one season to return home to him, the University of Missouri baseball program, to be the first African-American coach in the history of the SEC. And that coach is with us today. He is an amazing, amazing person, but also an amazing guest. Coach Carrick Jackson, head coach of Missouri baseball. Welcome to the mixtape. Appreciate you having me on, Cheats. I, having you back on, and I, I'm excited. I told you it's going to feel a little bit like deja vu because when we talked before, you were taking over a new program, about to go into your first season at Memphis, and we were talking about the historic context of that hire. This year, for for all it's worth, you leveled you leveled up, coach. You leveled up again, <laughs> not away from Memphis. Memphis is a great organization, great university. Yes, but yes. I'm talking about leveling up in the sense of making even more history. Uh, first African American coach in Missouri baseball history, I believe, and first African American coach in the history of the SEC for SEC baseball and all of its history. Coach, let me start with this. When you think about, say, the last 24 months, say, last 30 months of your life, everything that's happened, how do you and your family put everything in perspective? God is real. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's that simple. You know, we're very, very blessed uh, to to have been um, afforded all of these opportunities. Um, and as we all always say that <laughs> um, God has a plan uh, and, and a path for us uh, and we just follow it. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where um, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, I've believed in I've never looked for the next job. Uh, I've, I've believed in wherever I've been at make that the best place. Um, and as a result of that, other opportunities have been afforded to me. Uh, and, and this one is the ultimate. Um, this is the place that I've always wanted to be. This was my dream job. Uh, this was a program that, like, as you said before, I was here as an assistant from 2010 to 2015. So it's returning back home. Uh, at that time, I was the first black assistant coach in the SEC. Um, and, and so now to come back and, and be the head of the program now and, and, take the program to another level. I uh, couldn't ask for anything more. So, cause I'm always interested in the backstories here. I'm always interested because how, how did it come about? And then I know there are for every leader, every coach, there are destinations that you would consider, Hey, look, everything's off the table, except this. If I have this opportunity to do this job, then I'll listen Pretty much everything's off the table other than that. Was that the case as you just came in and took over Memphis? Was that the case where it was like, hey, look, most things, if not everything, but most things are off the table unless the University of Missouri, which you already said, dream job scenario for you, was on the table. How did it all come about? You're, that's that's exactly it, right? Like when we being able to have that Memphis job, because the Memphis job is one, as we talked about, you know, last time, I've always felt that that place could be a, a powerhouse. 
um, because of location and because of uh, the way that I wanted to do things and the, the, you know, makeup of the city and being a predominantly black, like it was, everything was the recipe for success was there. Um, but yes, this was that job. Um, this was the place that um, it, I wouldn't have left Memphis for anywhere else but this. Um, and, you know, when you look at my past and I've done some different things and moved around and, and had some different opportunities. And and the, the one thing that people don't understand or and or realize is all my other moves were moves of circumstance. They weren't necessarily moves of, oh, you know, hey, this is another, let me jump and go do this or let me jump and go do this. It was, um, you know, for us, I think as minority coaches, we have to carve a different path. Um, and so when you're looking to get to certain places, um, you know, looking at opportunities that are afforded to you. I mean, you and I talked, I, mm -hmm. I never wanted to leave Southern. Um, but it was a it was a decision that I had to make for our family because um, unfortunately we just, we just weren't able to do the things there that I wanted to do, um, and so so I I got out of coaching, which is something I've never wanted to do. I've always seen myself in that spot. So, but this was the one job, you know. Even when talking with Laird Veach, the AD at Memphis, um, that was a question he asked me. Uh, he said, you know, you know what 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 is what is the ultimate goal? And I said to find a home. Um, a place where I believe that we can build a regional power um, and sustain that level of success. Um, and if we can do that, then there's no need for me to go anywhere else. And I told him, except if the opportunity presented itself for me to go back home to Missouri. Um, and, uh, you know, when it when everything went down, my wife and I had the conversation and she asked me what I thought. And I said, you know what, it's too soon. I said, maybe if I'd been here at Memphis about two or three years I could see them, you know, making that phone call and tapping me on the shoulder. Um, but I said, no, nah, I just think it's too soon. I think they're probably going to go in a different direction. And, you know, it'll it'll come around. If it doesn't, I'm good. We're in a good spot. We're going to win and be successful here. And so I can retire at this place. And then like two days later, I got the phone call. That's a good point. And it's a good segue because that's the, that was my next question. When did this become real to you? I know, like you said, you got to keep tabs on things, but you're you're playing it. You're focused on what you got to do. You kind of start to hear things. But when did it become real to you that this was a real opportunity for you to make this bit, this transition, this bit of history? Yeah, you know, so it was uh, things just kind of fell in place, right? When you look at um, Blair DeBoard, who was the assistant uh, or associate AD at Memphis, um, who was over baseball, he actually ended up getting – the same position with obviously um, more responsibilities at University of Missouri. Yeah. Um, so he came in here and obviously speculation at that time was that, you know, uh, he's going in there and, but it was during the season. And so not sure what was going to happen. Um, and I think that connection of him being here and hiring me at Memphis um, and understanding and saw what we did in a one year uh, turnaround there and and we fell short of where I think we could have been you know we won 29 games uh, we probably left six to eight games on the table um, and and we talked to our kids about that at the end of the year of, of why that happened and what we can do to prevent that moving forward uh, but I think he saw with what I was handed and what we did with what we had uh, we did something pretty special there and we're moving in the right direction and so knowing what the program needed here, creating the same opportunities here. And and so um, he had familiarity, feel familiarity with who I am. And so I think that helped in uh, going through the process. And that's a good point. And I'm trying to, when did you believe, did you always think that this was an opportunity uh, when, when you started seeing moving play? I know you said things kind of fell into place, but there's got to be some moment where you're like, oh, this isn't just like, this isn't just feeling out. This isn't just for show. This is, you know, you look, you got the look, I know as a married man, I know you got to talk to the wife and the kid. You'd be like, this may be real here. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, I've been one of those people that I believe if you give me the opportunity, I'm yeah. going to maximize every effort and, and use every effort to make sure that I secure that opportunity. And for me, it was once I got the call, that was, then it was like, wrap. hey, yeah, it's a wrap. Like, yes, that, that's a wrap. Nope. Oh, they, they, they done messed up. <laughs> nobody, nobody else. And, and this obviously is no disrespect to anybody sure, um, sure, you know, sure. else that was in the mix. But 
nobody knows this place better than me, right? Mm-hmm. Like that, that that I potentially think that they were talking to. Nobody that they were talking to is more passionate about this place than me. Um, and, and there's some some other assistants that are out there that I, that I believe uh, that that played here, um, but are in different positions. And and so um, I felt at that point, if I didn't get it, I was going to lose it to one of those guys that I knew who either played here or coached here previously. I didn't think I, I, I did not think that I would lose out the job to someone who was not in that circle. Um, because I think the thing about Missouri um, is you have to understand who we are and how we have to go about our business um, to help us be successful. Cause we've done that in the past. And so I think that's what Desiree was looking for is who understands who we are and where we are and how we can be successful uh, moving forward. So, coach, tell me what you're stepping into, and what I mean by that is, you, you like you said, you were you were assistant here before. You you were an assistant under a, a, a kind of a legendary coach, if you will, right? Um, you went away from the program, coming back in now. Is it? I I know some things stay the same, but is it? Does it feel like a new uh, environment, new place, or is it? Is it feel uh, very familiar? Like how 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 do you assess like what you're stepping into as opposed to the time you were there in the past? You know, I think there's some 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 similarities uh, to when we were here before um, with regards specifically to just the environment and those kind of things. But then I think when you look at the administration, uh, there is a renewed sense of excitement um, and and desire for the program to be among the best programs in the country. And there's a support system there um, from Desiree and the administrative team to assist us in, in making that happen. So I think that's the biggest difference. Um, at the end of the day, I think we are who we are, right? Like, uh, you know, as, as I've talked to guys and, um, you know, it's one of those situations where, um, we, we don't have the best house on the sec block, but we got to have the best people in that house. Um, and, and we have to get our kids to understand, um, that what you have is the opportunity. And based on that opportunity, let's go out and compete. Um, whether or not we have the best stadium or, you know, the biggest budget or any, none of those things have anything to do with our ability to go out and compete. Um, and, and so really driving home that message and, and getting guys to understand that that's how we have to go about it. Um, but, but I like where we are. I like the direction of the program um, and, and her commitment as an AD uh, to wanting us to be successful. You couldn't ask for anything more. What is the first thing that you do when, when press conference is over you know, you, you, emotions are high, family's high, but 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 that stuff down is a little bit in, in the past because it's it's done. What's the first thing you do as the head of the baseball operation um, to to get you moving in the right direction? Is it talking to current players? Is it talking to new players? What's the first kind of thing that you have to do? Assistant coaches? What do you do to get uh, the Jackson era, if you will, underway? So it was it was first talking to the current players and at the same time getting our staff in place, Um, because when you're talking to current players and and where we are in this era of the portal, Mm -hmm. um, you know, talking to kids that we know we wanted to keep on board. um, But at the end of the day, those kids want to know, well, who's going to be the pitching coach and who's going to be the hitting coach. And and so it's it was kind of a chicken or the egg type deal, right? You're talking to those guys and at the same time talking to some of the kids that are coming in and some of the recruits that they have. And, and, but all those things are looped in um, together. And when talking to the recruits and talking about who's staying and keeping guys from leaving, they want to know what the plan is and who's we're bringing in. So you're also trying to make sure that, you know, we pull in the staff and get those guys going as, as soon as possible. So it was a, a lot of moving parts um, to, to get it started. But once, you know, now, like I said, we've been in school about three weeks now. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of settling in and establishing some norms. This this whole recruiting thing, we kind of get caught back up on that cycle. That becomes tough because recruiting is two, three years ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you walk in in a situation, you're automatically behind. So you have to play catch up um, to be able to get get guys in. But again, where we are with the portal it can help you and and bridge and fill some holes in the short term. You just got to make sure you get the right guys out of the portal uh, to be able to make sure you're, you're bringing in the right guys to, to help you do that. That's a good question. How have you adjusted? And what I mean by that, even at a program like Memphis, um, that's a, obviously a big jump from Southern. I know you took some time off and did some things, but kind of the, the jump and the, you know, resource changes from a Southern university to a Memphis, now you're jumping from a Memphis to SEC 
everybody knows about SEC baseball in that sense. The schedule you're going to have to play, the players you're going to have to play. One of the things that is uh, I'm interested to talk to you about, or curious to talk to you about, is that adjustment in NIL. And what I mean by that is, even in uh, even at you know University of Memphis or the conference you guys played in, they didn't have they they had good players, but you're going to the SEC where I know they have players that have their own brands. <laughs> I mean, they're they're selling their own T-shirts, right. making their own money because because SEC baseball is that noticeable. How yeah. how would you be able? How are you adjusting to? You know, obviously playing the. <laughs> you know, the LSUs and the Floridas, you know what I mean? Like, and knowing that a lot of those guys, because just the way that college works, college athletics works is they're going to use a lot of NL, NIL opportunities, right. To supplement whatever the baseball program doesn't have. And they've got, you know, just look at last year, Paul Skeens and Dylan Cruz <laughs> were, were brains in themselves. that could sell their own t-shirts yeah. better than the yeah. team store. Right. So right. How, how are you adjusting to being at a place that, you know, NIL is going to have to probably be, a you know, a, a bigger part of maybe the previous stops you were at. Yeah, I mean, I think when you talk about uh, the things that are familiar, right, the conference is a beast. It's the best conference in the country, hands down. So understanding the competitive level that we're coming into, and I mean, you know, it's it, this is one of those places. If I had hair, it would all be out you know, after <laughs> after some weekends because you know thirty thirty games in this thing is is a monster, right? And it it you know it just keeps coming. Um, and then when you add the idea of nil on that, um, it's one of those things where um, it's where we are. Um, you know, uh, hopefully we start to put some regulations on some things and and tighten some things up a little bit um, because it's, it's starting to get a little bit out of control. Um, I think that unfortunately <laughs> you think? we are, yeah, we, we are, we are sending some bad messages to kids that, that, uh, that we're entrusting our futures to. Right. Sure. And we, we're not, we're not correlating that. Right. As, sure. as um, you know, older adults that will be relying on the younger generation to support us. Yeah. We're, we're not, we're not factoring in the the idea that we're creating a sense of entitlement that will then what happens when that doesn't exist for them? Yeah. Can they still survive? Can they still be successful? Um, and and unfortunately, with the nature of where we are, that potentially, again, we're sending some bad messages. But that being said, it is where it is. I think for us, when it comes to NIL and the portal, I think we have to use both of those vehicles to supplement. We can't use those for me to develop or build our roster um, because it, it, for me personally, no disrespect to anybody else and how they're doing it. It doesn't allow me to establish the culture that I want to establish. Um, yes. At the end of the day, when you're in this league and as a head coach, I'm judged by the idea of winning and losing. Um, and, and we all recognize that and it is what it is. Um, I just believe that winning is a byproduct of doing things a certain way. Um, and, and that's, I think what our plan has to be. And we have to, we have to trust in that plan and we have to execute that plan, uh, to the, to the highest of levels. Um, and that once we get that kind of going, um, and that cycle creates itself, uh, we'll be in a good situation. If it doesn't, um, then what I thought was, was not the right way. And, and we make adjustments as a result. And you mentioned kind of – I'm glad you mentioned that because you're talking about kind of the messaging and some of the things that we can probably do around tightening up just the uniformity, if you will, the rules around NIL. It just seems to be kind of the wild, wild west out here, right? Um, yep. The thing that actually – it's I don't know if it's disturb, it's concerning to me. And maybe this is a byproduct of the COVID year. Maybe a byproduct of, you know, college eligibility, at least having seems it feel it's five, I think, but it feels like six or seven, <laughs> but, yeah, right. but, but the portal that you mentioned, I'm all for players feeling comfortable being able to transfer, especially if coach leaves They you know, play people, you know, it might be a new regime from when someone was recruited or expectations just didn't work out. I'm actually okay with the freedom. What I've started to see, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, what I've started to see is like a, a, a an, an all American that paid three years at one place for whatever reason is like, oh, my last year of eligibility or my, you know, my 
my first time before draft eligibility. I'm going to transfer from one D1 powerhouse to another D1. Like, that's the stuff that I just – I don't understand. And I'm trying to figure out, is 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 that good for the game? NIL is feeding the portal. Okay, is this what's per- happening? Per- okay. Per- period, end of story. Okay. Right? Like, it is – the the I like you said the idea of the portal of allowing kids to have the freedom if things aren't going the way that they'd like them to go at University X and they should be able to go and and go to a different school okay like I, I get that I think we could debate on whether or not there should have been some restrictions on that but again it is what it is but then once you, once you introduce NIL well now you have guys that are getting into the portal because they're being promised yep. better situations at other places which nil is not supposed to be used for inducement um but it is being used because they have a friend that's playing on this other team and that coach tells them hey let your boy know that if he gets in the portal we got sixty thousand dollars in the scholarship for him um to come and play at our university and so again (laughs) the argument was made and i was just having this conversation the argument was made that oh well coaches can leave and Mm -hmm. make changes why can't the players if I leave Missouri tomorrow, I owe them a bunch of money, <laughs> period. Right? Like right. that, yeah. that, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I'm not just up and leaving. Right. There, There is a check that has to be written um, at the time of my departure. And so it's not that coaches just can get up and leave. And then the other part to that is when we're making this comparison to players and coaches, coaches get fired if they don't win. As a player, if you're not successful, if you don't play the way that I think you should play, I can't fire you by NCAA rules. Mm. We're not allowed to do that if you, if you don't perform at a at the level that you're supposed to. So when we when we talk about excuse me, when we talk about the idea of players having the same rights as coaches, well, if we're going to give them the same rights, well, then make sure they have the same responsibilities and accountabilities as well. Mm. That that as a coach, if I don't win, I get fired. Mm. As a coach, if I take another job and leave within the midst of my contract, well, then there's money owed to the previous school. Right. So it's not it's not that you're just up and leaving and, you know, hey, we're you know, there's there's things that go along with that. And and many times as coaches, we're making decisions to make moves based on what's in the best interest of our family, so on and so forth. So, again, I think when we we look at that in its totality you just have to factor all those things in but now now again you have the portal being fed by NIL and and we have kids that you know in in its in its essence right NIL name image likeness well you're asking me for money and nobody knows who you are <laughs> what, what what is what is your name image and likeness worth Right. So if we're if we're truly going off name, image and like this, when you look at football and basketball, it's different. Right. Because people know those players, they're buying those jerseys of those players. But then once we start to get down to some of these Olympic sports, it has nothing to do with name, image and like it. name, image and likeness. It's all about where the market is. It's worth I, I agree with you. Ninety percent, ninety five percent of that, because I do think, like we just mentioned, there are some players now, especially in your conference. Yes. That. that <laughs> If not at the beginning of the season, by the end of the season, like I said, some of those LSU guys, some of those um, Tennessee guys, you know what I mean? Some of those first top round draft picks, they they can put their name on a T-shirt. I, look, I bought a couple of them. <laughs> uh, I bought it. So, I mean, you know, again, I think you have to be tuned into it. As you know, college baseball is a culture into itself. Yes. And, and so when you're talking about – uh you know, some of those environments, what is it, Mississippi State, and the, you know what I mean, like the, the right field line of some of these places, then you're just like, I, I, you know, that person is, you know, he will have a, a, a monetary attachment to that. Yes. I do, I do have a challenge, like I said, with if you played three All-American seasons at in Missouri, Missouri baseball, I'm like, bruh, do you really need to be at – you know, for the last year, do you really need to be at Georgia Tech? I don't. I don't think so. You know. Well, but so, but that's and and that's the problem, right? Is yeah, that, yeah. Is that they are at the University of Missouri, and then again through their yeah. friends. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah. Hey, hey, we're going to give you a hundred grand if you come over here. 
but where these kids, they don't think about it. And I've asked some of them, what happens if you go there and you don't play? Right. Does the, does the money substitute? Yeah. And, and don't think, well, you know, if they're investing in me, they're going to put me on the field. No, they're not. This isn't professional baseball. Mm. They can spit, they can give you a hundred grand and have you sit on the bench and be a depth player. Because if you can't help them win, that's the, that's the bottom line. Mm. Professional baseball, me and you are shortstops. You get drafted for a million dollars. I get drafted for a hundred thousand dollars. You have 900,000 more reasons why you're going to make it. And I'm not. Right, like that is true. That is cut true. And dry, nothing, but, nothing, but, nothing more real than that. No, but in college baseball, college athletics, it, I don't care what kind of scholarship you're on and what kind of NIL deal you have. If you can't help us win, you could have a three hundred thousand mm. dollar NIL deal. If you can't help me win, you're gonna sit on the bench next to me. Mm. It does not equate, and that's what some of these kids are like. Oh well, they they're showing interest. They're vesting in me. No, they're covering themselves and having depth you're a good depth player and if you end up being the starter great but if you don't well they got a quality depth player as well yep so because then look you've done many things coach Let, uh, to put a button on this take off your head coaching hat because i know look you've been an executive at the top is level at top levels here if you were to look at the landscape and try to figure out because I, again I, I i believe in nil in that sense i don't want to take it away from players but how do you how do you right what's what's a simple thing they could do to to make it a little bit more regulated? Uh, you know, I probably I think the there's a couple things I think. One could be give the institutions a salary cap. So Ooh. tell t- okay. tell the universe <clears throat> tell the universe University of Missouri you have five million dollars for the entire athletic department. Okay. I and get, then as an, as an yeah, AD, you cap it off yeah, yeah. You, you cap it off because then now you you're able to spread that out and the richest don't just get to right like even as in pro sports you got a you got Reven- salary cap. revenue share. Right. oh yeah you got right. yeah. Well, you got you know what what is it? you got a, you got a penalty what is it a penalty too with the like they're like right, all right exactly. I'll pay the penalty just give me my players yeah and and so if you want to pay the penalty you know yeah, again, yeah I, get, I get what you're where, saying I get what you're saying that's where we're moving right like we we, we yeah. need to stop with the idea that these are amateurs um once you're starting to pay kids yeah. um to and and they say it's not pay for play but then when you're holding me hostage or you're saying I can go to school X and they're gonna give me fifty if you want me to stay, I need you to give me 50. Well, what am I paying for? Again, no. nobody knows the first baseman freshman from Nebraska. He, he's got to, you know, he's got to kind of justify himself first. So it's such a hard sport to predict. And what I mean yes. by that is, uh, and I'm sure throughout your career, you've, you've experienced this over and over again. Um, but it's, you know, you're recruiting kids that may be freshmen and sophomores in high school. Who knows what happens in the next two years by the time yeah, they get yeah. to your program? And I and I and I look at that because even when we get to the professional ranks, right? We're looking at uh, guys that may have played three years in college. Obviously, a lot of them get drafted out of high school too. And there, baseball's such a tough uh, route to the pinnacle, right? Like to, to, yep. to ultimately be an MLB player, uh, no matter how hot shot you are, you could, you know, you could sign a $6 million signing bonus in the first round. And three years later, you're still not there. You know what I mean? So yep, yep. it is, it is just such a tough, let's go back to Missouri uh, going into this season. We already talked about, obviously the conference is scheduled, the historic nature of your hire. Um, but what, what are you excited about on the baseball field? Like when you look at the group of guys you're bringing in, the collection of, of talent and, and the things that you're about to embark on when you really get out there and start start doing the things that you need to do, what what, what are you excited about? You know what? I, I think the idea of building, right, is, is the exciting part of it is, is just – getting it to be where you know it can be, you know, obviously for me, year one um, culture, we have to, we have to change the culture. We have to get these guys to understand how we have to go about our business. You know, you talked about the SEC and it being the best league and and the players and, and what happens. I think people forget when they're looking at SEC baseball is you see the Paul Skeens and you see the Tommy tanks and you, you mm-hmm. see these guys and you look and you get, 
you get awed by their ability. But if you took every program in the SEC and you gave every guy that is in a starting rotation as pitchers and every starting position player in the lineup and you gave them average college ability, the skill level in this league is supreme. Right. And so then you add ability on it, the ability to throw 102 miles an hour, the ability to hit 25 bombs. Then that takes it to a whole nother level, but strip the ability away and make it average. The skill level is very high. Well, what we know about skill level, you can improve skill level. Ability, God's blessed you with it or he hasn't. Right. We can maximize the ability that you have, but we can improve skill level. And so when you can improve skill level and put your skill level, on the same par as your your competition, well, then that now gives you puts you in a situation where who's going to play the best on that day, and then the outliers are the skeins and the tanks and and the likes of of those guys in the league that can do doe landers and and all those kind of guys that can do some really really special things. But as we see, Paul Skeens didn't go through the year with a zero ERA, right? Tommy White didn't go through, and these other guys didn't go through the, the year with, you know, never striking out and yeah. never making an out. Uh, and so now that's where the the gamesmanship and the chess match comes into play is, can I let this player with supreme ability and skill not affect the game to where he is able to take it over? Yeah. Um, and so with our guys here, it's changing that culture, getting their mindset right, increasing their skill level, and getting them to understand that when we get into conference, we got to throw strikes, compete, and play good defense, have quality of bats. And if you do that and don't make mistakes in this league, you put yourself in a position to be able to be successful. If you don't do that, you make a mistake in this league, you're not getting up off the map. Mm -hmm. The other team is going to capitalize. They're going to expose it. And before you know it, now you're chasing three or four runs and – you chase too many runs here, and they start going to the bullpen. It's a wrap. No, absolutely, and it's 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 you know I'm learning the more I learn about that spirit of college baseball and just how everything works. It, it it's it's you know you're talking about how pitching is so important, um, and just understanding what it means uh, on the the you know the what I guess it's the Friday night starter, right? Like the 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 first guy. I I didn't know even little things, coach. Um, as I've learned uh, throughout the years, but it's like, hey, that guy's a Friday night starter because you want him to work deep, so you don't have to go uh, later in the bullpen in the in the, in the second, like later half of the series and those types of things. So if they, you know, your 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 ace or your dog is taking that taking that ball and the bump on the first game and hopefully kind of going deep and and certain things like that. When you look at those SEC. Uh, series especially those series on the on the weekends a lot of them under the lights is there anything just from your previous experience at missouri uh to now coming in uh obviously to heading this program is there is there a series that you put i mean all of them i know are competitive but is there one that you put an asterisk beside beside this season and say man I, i'm really looking forward to, to to getting those three or four games in you, you know, it's funny, like you said, they're all competitive. Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't necessarily know if you <clears throat> can place one uh, over the other. Um, I think when you look at some of your programs that have um, been at the top, um, you always want to go in there and put your best foot forward in those types of situations. But, um, you know, when you look at our schedule this year and in our SEC schedule, it, from the first weekend to the last weekend, it's a, good it's a grind. There's, good luck. Yeah, there's no – yeah, you, you, you don't look in there and say, oh, well – here's a break here or here's right. a break here. No, it, it's it, your, your break is on Monday after the series is over on Sunday where you get to breathe and you don't have a game um, there, but there, there's no breaks in there. And so it's, it's, it's buckle up and, and get that thing going uh, from the jump. What do you have any plans? What are your plans to make? Cause again, like you said, you, we can all get um, kind of wrapped up in the lure of, Oh, I'm going to Vandy or I'm going to LSU or so forth do you have planes? How are we going to make your home field Missouri baseball? How are we going to make a stamp where people are like, man, not just obviously on the field with great baseball, but like, is there any things that we can do or you can do that's like, man, when they go play at Missouri, you're going to see this. Well, I think the biggest thing for us is, um, you know, one, 
the weather is in our favor, right? Mm-hmm. And we're the farthest team north in the league. And so if we get guys up here early, um, we're accustomed to playing in the weather. Most of those teams aren't. Um, so that's an advantage for us. Um, I think when uh, we do have good weather, we have a good fan base. They're passionate. Um, last year, they set some records uh, in attendance that they hadn't done before. Um, and so I think just the environment that is here is a unique one. Um, and and the fans here have shown that when the weather's good and you're playing well, they're coming out. And, mm. and you know, with this new change and starting this new direction, um, the goal is that we get people out here from the jump um, and, and get this thing going and, and get them excited and create some some fan atmosphere around it and, and a place for the students to come out and do their thing um, and just – Again, create that excite- excitement about what we've got going on here. Excellent. Coach, I'm going to get you out of here on two last questions. Um, just because uh, having the opportunity to talk to you, and I know it's a passion of yours as well, in regards to just getting more uh, black coaches in the positions that you're in. I know you've been a big proponent of, you know, talking to assistant coaches, you know, trying to help them get in positions where they can be successful as well, not just at your school, but all over. Uh, year now, last year we talked about it. There were two, then there were five. Uh, when we talked about your hire, uh, Blake Beamer's hire, Lane's uh, Ratchford's hire over at Maris, along with Coach Thompson and, and, and Coach Pollock. Um, obviously, you made the jump. As you kind of look over in the assessment, I know of a, of a couple of new assistant coaches, African Americans, but how are we doing? Do we, we need to do, obviously, we're, we were playing catch up when it comes to black coaches and, in division one baseball um you know we're playing catch up to a point where it it almost seems or feels insurmountable at times but when you look at i guess the transitions between last year this year and then moving forward how would you assess where we are right now again i think we're moving in the right direction um and, and like you said it's it's one of those deals where um hopefully one of these days we we stop talking about first um, and and that we we're in a better position um, to where when you look across the landscape of college baseball specifically that you do see more minority coaches out there and and again um, it it is a passion of mine it is it is a mission of mine to create opportunities and with our staff here we you know we got Jabari Brown who came over from Vanderbilt we got Jose Carbio um, who was at Bethune Cookman my director of uh, player development uh, Joe Detoli um, is a minority. Uh, uh, director player development. And so creating opportunities of graduate assistance, whatever we can do here, um, um, we're going to do that and and give uh, minority coaches an opportunity to be at the highest level, which also means they're going to have the highest level of visibility, um, which then in turn means that the success that we're going to have, there's going to be a direct correlation uh, with what we're doing here and their part in that, which hopefully then in turn will also present them with other opportunities moving forward. Absolutely. Uh, I know it's a great responsibility. Uh, You have great ability. So with that ability, the responsibility comes. And like I said, it's a credit not only to uh, your character, the fact that it's not just at Missouri. I I, I know you care about this mission beyond just the the walls of your institution. And I I think it's already proven just with your influence alone and what, what you've done um, it's proven to be moving in the right direction, right? And and we just got to make sure that, uh, you know, just a, as a culture, a larger kind of environment when you talk about college baseball, that they keep, uh, keep that focus and keep, you know, just looking for the opportunities. I think that's the misconception. Um, you know, the people that you talk about are all, like, uh, extremely overqualified, right? So it's not, it's not that. It's just they've got to get the opportunities uh, and do the things that uh, will, I think, help move that that ball uphill. And and you're doing that, and and I commend you always for that. Um, I no, appreciate it. Well, and, and <clears throat> you know, I mean, shoot, at the end of the day, let's keep it 100. Our success here is dependent upon the next person's opportunity. Yep. And, and and I recognize that it's not about me. Um, it's not about me having individualized success. It's not about me getting pats on the back and, and all that. It's, you know, the, the, having the honor of being the first black head baseball coach in the SEC is, is outstanding. Um, but we have to be successful so that the next hiring cycle and the next opportunities that present themselves, ADs look and say, well, wait a minute, look at what happened here. Maybe we need to go down this path. 
now that now that 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 glass ceiling has been broken now does it happen in the ACC does it happen in the Big 10 does it you know obviously it, it happened with Spencer in the Big 10 but the, do we do we revisit that again mm-hmm. um that, yeah, I was gonna say the pack, but we don't know what's gonna happen with the pack and where, where that's gonna be. But we don't. We have no um, clue. No clue. Exactly. Is it the Big Twelve? Like, wh- where right. is it that that we start to create some more opportunities and see some more opportunities? Um, but um, our level of success here will have a direct correlation to if we start to see uh, more minority coaches, and specifically black coaches, hired uh, to be head coaches in in some of these power leagues. And, and and that's why, honestly, I think given all that you've been through as an individual, all the different tasks you've done, all because we talked about in the first podcast, people can go back and listen to it, but your experience is vast. But the idea, um, that's why it, it, you also fully understand that, you know, you basically you got to be rooted where you are and you and you are that. And you're going to focus on success on on the field and that and all the other stuff will be, you know, I think there'll be direct correlations, as you mentioned, I think there'll be but that obviously that's not your your immediate focus, your immediate focus is getting the program in a place where you you have got, you know, feel like you're going to be competitive and successful, like we said, in one of the toughest conferences, the toughest conference and all of D1 baseball, right? Um, Coach. Let me ask you this before we get you out of here, because I, you know, just following on social media, seeing the whirlwind uh, of the hire and the program, we got a chance a little bit to see your amazing family. Uh, And I want to ask, have you had any time? (laughs) Have you had any time at all to, uh, you know, take the family away? I know they're back in school now, but like take the family away, enjoy any vacation. Cause I, I have a feeling once you accept a role like this, as you did, you know, previously, you want to like dive two feet in and just go, 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 go. What is the like, did you get a vacation? Do you get a chance to take your family away and spend some time uh, alone? Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't a true vacation. Uh, my, my, my mother-in-law <laughs> lives. No. About, yeah, my mother-in-law <laughs> lives 30 <laughs> minutes uh, south of here. And yeah. Um, so we were able to, you know, I was able to go down there a couple days and she's, you know, she's got like 30 some odd acres with a pond. And so the boys were able to fish and we were able to swim and kind of hang out for a day or two here or there. And, uh, but yeah, no, it, it'll, we'll, we'll take some vacation time once, once, uh, once no, we get won't. this thing up and rolling. So yeah, you just look, look, what was, no, uh, I, was there any, look, I, cause again, like I said, I've been, I will be, uh, celebrating my 10 year anniversary of, of, of being married uh, next month. Yeah. Was there, is there any part of this at all? Like, cause again, I know that all the circumstances were right. You're going home. Was there any part of this where it was like, Ooh, I got to look, look, I got to, I got to, I got to talk to the wife cause we're doing this again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny because when we made the move to Memphis, uh, she said to me, she said, you asked me to move again before the boys graduate from high school, you're going to be on your own. Um, and so uh, one of her one of her best oh, friends actually one of her best friends actually lives here in Columbia. OK. And so when they made the coaching change, she sent my wife the text uh, to, or the tweet um, and the screenshot. And then my wife called me because I, w- I didn't know. Um, oh, really? So, wow. Uh, yeah. I and so she's like. So am I gonna have to go back on what I said? I said that's up to you. Like, right? You, 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 you made the call. Yeah, I'm not you getting it. Yeah, yeah. I love uh, it. You know, and and but she knew. Uh, I mean, both our boys were born here God. when we when we were married. We were living here, and okay. she knows how special this place is. Like I said, her mother lives 30 minutes away. We're from St. Louis originally. Um, so to to be able to to get to a spot where um, I can truly truly say that. Um, this is, this is where I'm going to retire, um, you know, uh, because this is a special place for us. And it's it's not because it's the SEC. It's because it's this place. Right. Um, if this was in the Ohio Valley or the Missouri Valley or the Sun Belt, or whatever, it's this place that makes it special for me um, and, and us as a family. And then then once you unwrap it um, and the fact that we're in the SEC, that, that just makes it better. But this institution, what this place – uh, exudes from a, a passionate fan base standpoint and the the alums that are passionate about this program that's why this is the place 
Well, and that's why you are the right man for the job. Coach Carrick Jackson, it's always a pleasure to have you on the mixtape. Uh, look, we'll do it again. And look, we'll do it again. And, and, I'm, and I'm certain I'm 100%. I'm calling it right now. When we do it again, you will still be wearing a Missouri baseball jersey. <laughs> you got that right. You got Excellent. that right. Coach, I really appreciate it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Black Baseball Mixtape. We'll be back after this.